Hello once again and welcome to the Amalgamated with Christ Church where the purpose statement remains the same to bring people back into fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. Today I want to present to you from Romans chapter 12 and we'll pay attention to verses 17 to 21. Romans chapter 12 verse 17 to 21 and it's very simple. The first thing that salutes your eyes, right there, it says, Repay no one for evil. Repay no one for evil. In other words, it's telling us something that many of us in Christendom, we struggle with, and it's what's called a grudge. Many of us in Christendom, we struggle with grudges. A grudge is a persistent feeling of ill will towards someone or even something resulting from a past injury or an insult. A grudge is a persistent feeling of ill will towards something or someone resulting from a past injury or insult. Now many of us in Christendom have been hurt or are going through pain or is about to go through some pain and so because of that it's very common for us to adopt the defense mechanism of the world and arbor a grudge a persistent feeling of ill will towards someone or something resulting from a past insult or a injury now you can say that they hurt me, preacher. You don't know what you're talking about, so I have a right to feel how I feel. That's, yes, you're true. That's true. You have a right. God gave each and every one of us free will. And then he also revealed unto us what he wants us to know. Though you have free will, you have free will to choose what is right, and you have free will to not choose or to reject what is right. The scripture is saying right here, repay no one evil for evil. Forgiveness can be hard for some of us, especially when we are wronged. And when I say wrong, I, I mean sometimes it's grievous bodily harm. People can say, you know what, I've been to church, I've been molested in church, I've been molested in my house, molested on my job, beaten up, lied against, lied upon, robbed, taken advantage of, used, spit out, every manner of evil that you can think of has been met it out to me, dished out to me in no uncertain terms. So I have a right to feel how I feel. The scripture is saying it's not so. Because if that was the case, then God would not have been merciful unto us to send his only son, Jesus, after we have grieved him. Those people when they were crucifying and mocking and spitting on and beating on and doing all those stuff. And many champions of the faith throughout the years for this gospel to come to us have suffered and endure brutality, hardship. Some of us when we decide to accept Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior and to walk away from tradition, we're outcast, castigated. Lose our identity, lose our family, lose everything that we hold there. But I want to caution you and to bring you comfort that Jesus said that he did not come here to bring peace but a sword. And when I say peace meaning did not come here to condone fellowship with works of darkness. But he is the prince of peace, everlasting peace, because, they, because, because God gave us a peace that surpasses all understanding. But you must belong to him. And so, if you find it hard to forgive because of hurt, sometimes you may want to cover up 
a wrong that has been handed down to you with another wrong. You may want to correct a wrong with a wrong. But that is unbiblical. You can't be a child of God embracing scripture, getting up and dancing. And still holding a grudge, a persistent feeling of ill will towards someone or something. Resulting that are due to a past insult or injury. If that was the case, the scripture wouldn't tell you repay no one for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible as much as depend on you. Live peaceably with all men. You see, sometimes it's going to be dependent on you. The person may not accept you, may not want to hear from you, may hate you, may want to see you dead, but you are not going to repay evil for evil. Sometimes you may have been the perpetrator. Sometimes you may have been the molester. Sometimes you may have been the abuser. Sometimes you may have been the robber. You may have been the liar. You may have been the one that throws someone under the bus. And they may have all the grudge against you. But your job is to live peaceably with all men. Because it depends on you. Reason? Because you're a child of God. This portion of scripture that I highlighted, Romans 12, 17 to 21, it outlines how love should act. It's love, it's love in action. So you can't be a child of God and embrace a grudge, a persistent feeling of ill will. That's the definition of grudge. A persistent feeling of ill ill will towards someone or something resulting or, or because of a past insult or injury. You see, sometimes some simple little things can cause us to hold grudges, you know. I don't like how they look at me. They don't live in the right neighborhood. They don't look like me. They're of the wrong race. They have the wrong culture. They have the wrong social economic status. I don't want to associate it with them. And so you hold a feeling of ill will towards someone. You carry a grudge towards them. And it's worse when someone wrong you. But two wrongs do not make a right. I often say to my wife over the years, we always talk and I always say, you cannot have your right and give it away. Because you feel like you're going to do something to someone. And so that's a principle that we have adapted. We cannot have our right and give it away. Sometimes we're going to give it away because of pride. We don't want society to say you're soft. So you're going to act. The scripture did not tell you to seek vengeance. What the scripture tell you instead, it says right there in verse 20, Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you'll pull down a pot of coal on his head. If you are a child of God, the scripture is speaking to you this morning. And even if you are not a child of God, hearken your ears, listen. You do not repay evil for evil. The reason? God is the one that has all destination in his hand. And the scripture is clear. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 13. For we know him. Him who Jesus Christ. We know him who we know God. He said that vengeance is mine and I will repay, say the Lord. I will repay. So when you take it onto yourself to repay for evil for evil, you are circumventing God. You're doing what God should do. And I say to you, you are not God Almighty. You may be privy to certain weapons of mass destruction. You may be privy to certain information that you can use to hurt someone. To create havoc in their lives because you're going to say they hurt me. And because they hurt me, they have to pay. And I want to see them dead. Sometimes you don't even want to see them dead. Sometimes some of us say dead is too good for that person. What we want, we want to see them suffer. We don't want them to die. 
Because if they die, they will get away too quickly. We want them to suffer. Some of us willfully wish. You can't pray. You can't pray. You wish some evil thing to befall someone. Some of us are evil within our mind because we carry grudges. And because of the evil intent that we harbor, we wish generational destruction on certain people. The child has done you no wrong. It's the granddad's granddad. It's coming from generations ago. And this applies to all of us within society. All of us in society, and it's a very painful subject to touch on. Especially those of us who are descendants of African. Knowing that we have been through, or our foreparents have been through this horrendous slave trade. Journey across the Middle Passage. Millions of us underneath the sea. Over 400 years in shackled slavery. And after that was done to suffer the indignation of Jim Crow's law. Segregation. It's still happening in some instances today. So we have suffered that. We have suffered that. But not because we suffer that. We're going to take on the persona of the enemy, the persona of the world by carrying with us a grudge. Some people are saying you're stupid. Because your four parents have been there and done that. But I say in order for, for such a horrendous act to have occurred, it took many willing parties. Some of our four parents benefited from the slave trade because they sold some of us. And scrupulous people. Yes. That's a whole nother subject. But don't get it twisted. Not repaying for evil for evil does not mean you do not know your history. But knowing your history and harboring unforgiveness within your heart is a different thing. Because you can't harbor unforgiveness and singing that I want to go to heaven. In heaven there is no segregation. It's going to be one and all. You probably meet up on someone who have done you wrong in the past. What are you going to do? You're going to ask God to take him out of heaven? What are you going to do? Some of us like to sing some old spirituals. I want to go to heaven and rest. You will not find rest if you endure evil within you. Because you won't make it into heaven. Because to make it into heaven you must be holy. You must be righteous. You must be born again. You must have a new mindset. And the new mindset is saying to us, you cannot repay evil for evil. Very tough message. Sometimes we're in society and people will plot against us. Insult us. Do all manner of evil for us. And to put you down and to degrade you. The enemy don't wait to do these things in private, you know. It's different when you're insulted in your house by yourself. But the enemy wait until you're in church. Some preachers suffer when they're in church preaching. Then someone from the past run into the church, bust through the door, spew insult at them. Some of you, you're on the job. They wait until you receive a promotion. Then they run up and they spew insult on you. Remind you of your past. You want to forget your past so bad. You want to forget your past so bad. But I tell you this. You cannot separate yourself from your past. You can have a new mindset. The scripture says be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. But your past is always going to be your past. If you're a thief, 
and you stick your hand through someone's window to steal and they cut your hand off and you decide to be born again, you're still going to walk around with one hand. And that's going to remind you. But the reminder does not make you the new creation. The reminder does not make you the new creature. It's the renewing of your mind that makes you a new creature. Where am I going with this? I'm saying one of the common reasons many of us carry grudges is because of a simple thing such as an insult. We're macho. We have been bred. Especially in this wet must hemisphere, we do not take talk. Many wars could have been solved just by I am sorry, I apologize, or just by walking away. But instead, we have gang warfare going up because I, I, I don't like how you, you look at me. Do you know who I am? Do you know where I'm from? I don't, I don't like it. And so you want to take vengeance. Jesus spoke to us and tell us about that. Matthew chapter 5 verse 38. Scripture was clear. You have heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This was something that was said in the Old Testament. This was something that was said in the book of Deuteronomy. You have heard it said in Deuteronomy. The eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. There was a law that was put in place so there was no chaos in society. So man could not go out and do vigilante killing. Some society promote vigilante killing. So Jesus said, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But Jesus goes on to say, but I tell you not to resist an evil, evil person. Meaning, I tell you not to, not to retaliate. Resist here can mean take the person uh, 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 to retaliate against a person. That's what it means right there. Retaliation. I tell you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slap you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you, take away your tunic. Let him take your cloak also. We're going to get into that. Because many people look at these scriptures and say that you're a Christian, you're supposed to be a pacifist. That's not what it means. So you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That was simply something to put in, that was put in place under the Mosaic law. So there would be or should not have been any private retaliation. You should not exact revenge privately. But Jesus declared that Okay, I am here now, I fulfill the law. So Jesus is saying, you have heard it said. So Jesus commands us to resist, means to avoid retaliation. But I tell you to resist an evil person, meaning do not retaliate. Turn the other cheek. You're saying, wow, that's what I want you to explain now. Turn the other cheek. Because there's no way someone is going to come up to me and Punch me in the face and I turn the other cheek. Note what the scripture says right there. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the left cheek. You see this action was not denoting a hoping ended slap in the face. It was talking about a slap with the back of the hand. Which meant an insult. Someone wants to insult you. They come and they slap you in the back of the, the, the back of the hand. Does that mean they want to do you grievously bodily harm right there? It's just in the back of the hand. So they insult you. It's an insult. Doesn't warrant you to retaliate against them. Turn the other cheek. Let them do it again. Walk away. It takes a lot out of you to endure an insult. This does not mean someone is going to come and punch you in the face. Run down on you and beat you up and you're going to stand there and just hold, lay down and take beating. Does that mean so? This is, this picture right here denotes an action of insult to the back of the hand. In some cultures, especially back in the day, that was a significant insult. Some culture... 
Back in the day, if a man used a glove, especially European, to so slap you in the face, you know you're down for a duel. They're not going to say to you, let's meet outside for a duel. A man just walk up to you with his glove and slap you in the cheek. And you know what time it is. Now, you can walk away or you can go and duel with him. Someone is going to die. Now, this action is different. It's the palm, not, 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 not the palm of the hand, the back of the hand. So don't let the enemy draw you out by saying that you're a pacifist. With the back of the hand, it's very... It would be very difficult for someone to really put it on. Well, some people are big, some people are small. But in that culture, that was significant because it's an act of insult. Even today, if you really want to look at it, people will get slapped in the face at all time. And they don't get up and kill someone. They feel humiliated insulted that's what it is now for the perpetrator to really stand there when you say here tear the other cheek and to do it again it takes a lot out of that person so jesus is saying resist resist the action resist retaliation it is a very hard thing to do but the scripture says, do not repay evil for evil. Rep do not insult the person because they insult you. An insult, insult in some instances can be someone telling you something. And when they tell you something, what are you going to do? Are you going to repeat vulgarities? Are you going to also engage in tit for tat? Are you going to have the last word? Some of us love to have the last word, you know. Some of us, your mama can't cook. Your mama can't fry. Your mama can't dress. Your mama can't walk. And it goes on and on and on and on. It goes on and on and on and on. You have to let bygones be bygones. The scripture saying, do not repay evil for evil. Ending an insult does not mean a Christian is a pacifist. Let me tell that to you. Ending an insult does not mean that you are a pacifist. The scripture right here, Matthew 5, right here, verse 39, does not say that you are to make people run up on you, run in your house, break in your house, kick down your door, rape your wife, kill you, rob you. As a matter of fact, the scripture gave us permission to use self-defense. But when you're using self-defense, it must be done with wisdom. It must be done with wisdom. You're saying, preacher, can you show me where the scripture said that? Uh, 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 give us permission to use self-defense. Okay, let's go to the scriptures. The go-to book. Everything that was written aforetime time was written for our learning. Now, Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Listen to verse 35. And he said to them, this is Jesus speaking to the disciples, when I sent you out without a money bag, then listen, it says, Napsa, did you lack nothing? Then verse 36, listen. Then he said to them, but now he who has money, money bag, let him take it likewise a knapsack. He who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. What do you think Jesus is saying buy a sword to do? To use as a walking stick? What do you think Jesus was telling them to do? Self-defense is necessary. So some people are saying, but so why does the church have a harm guard at the door? Because self-defense is necessary. Why do you need to have two, three, four guns in your house? Self-defense is necessary. You think someone is going to break into the house? And I'm going to sit idly by and say, have your way with my family. It's not going to go like that. That's different from an insult. That is an act. Someone is coming to do you grievous bodily harm. No, two wrongs don't make a right. 
And so you can have your weapon and use it inappropriately. You can have your sword and use it inappropriately. Because someone insults you. Oh, what? He did what? I'm going inside. Don't let me see you when I get outside. And you come outside. It was just an insult. And you come outside and you do someone harm. And then guess what? Authorities are coming to take you into custody. The person that did you harm, they get away. Two wrongs don't make a right. You use wisdom. You cannot correct a wrong with a wrong. And so you use wisdom. You use wisdom. That's what the scripture is saying right here to us, my brothers and sisters. Look at this portion of scripture. John 18. I'm telling you that you can have your weapon and you can use it inappropriately. Jesus said to them, buy a sword. They got their sword. Now they came to arrest Jesus, John chapter 18, verse 10. Peter, the hothead. Some of us can be hothead in Christendom. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servants and cut off his right ears. Cut it off. And verse 11, what did Jesus say? Put your sword in the seat, sheet, Peter. Shall I, drink, shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Jesus was sent for a mission to redeem us. It was his cup to bear. Jesus did not resist. Jesus did not fight. Jesus did not say to them, they are coming, attack them. No. It was a very insulting thing, but Jesus did not say attack them. Jesus understood that it was his cup to bear. Sometimes an insult is going to be your cup to bear. And because it's your cup to bear, you should not, you must not repay evil for evil. Jesus did not tell them to attack. But Peter did an appropriate action. And when Peter did what he did, Jesus told him to put it away. So you do not repay evil for evil. But that's not talking about self-defense. So don't let them tell you that as a Christian you're supposed to be a pacifist. Sometimes when someone wrong you, you can go ahead and use the law too, you know. Someone go around spreading rumors and lies on you, hurting you, defaming you. You're saying, the naysayers must say, you're a Christian, you should just endure it. Let them drag your name through the mud. Pretend like they, they you're, aren't you supposed to be a child of God? Yes, but the Apostle Paul was wronged. And the Apostle Paul had to seek legal action. Acts number 16 Acts number 16, look at 17 there. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly. Uncondemned Romans and have thrown us in the prison. And now do they put us out secretly? They want to say, oh, go away, go away, Paul. Don't do anything to us. Let them come themselves and get us out. And you read on down to verse 39. What is that saying right here? Paul used the system to exact an a, a apology or a judgment. He did not take matters in his own hand. Do not repay evil for evil. Two wrongs do not make a right. But you do not have to sit still and be violated. You do not have to sit still. And let someone rob you, do you wrong, treat you, treat you. When I say rob you, do you wrong, I'm talking about not a simple little insult right there. For example, you're not going to sit down and a thief is going to break in your house. And you're going to sit back and say, oh, I got, a, I got a safe in my bedroom. Come and open it. Here's a combination. Take, take everything and go. Oh, you didn't ask for this too, but I'm going to give you this shoe. Take it too. Take everything. The scripture made it clear. In Exodus 22, you know, you should treat a thief. Verse 2 to 3. Don't think the thief is coming in there to pity you or to pat you on the head. Don't think the thief is going to say, please, Mr. Housekeeper. Please, Mr. Pastor Man. Can I take this? 
How many home invasions you have heard where the homeowners didn't even put up resistance and they were killed because of some unscrupulous people? The scripture says right here in Exodus 22 verse 2, If the thief is found breaking in and he's struck so that he dies, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. But if the thief break in your house and the thief is gone, and you see the thief two days later, you strike him, guess what? You are wrong. Because he was not in the act anymore. He was not in the act anymore. So you do not pay, repay evil for evil. Now, even in society, even in society, though they do not want to admit at times, they're pretending like they did not get their laws from the Bible, you know. They pretend like they don't, you know. Giving us the authority to defend yourself and telling you exactly how it is. For example, in, in, in the state of Florida, you have the stand your ground law and the castle doctrine. Stand your ground law. If you perceive or if you feel as if you're going, you, you, there's a reasonable threat to your life, you do not have to retreat. You have, the, you have the authority to use force to defend yourself. And the castle doctrine... You're standing in the middle of your yard and someone is running against you. You can't, don't do anything to them. Go in your house. Walk away from the threat. No, you're in your house and they kick in your door and run in your house. It's your house. Your house is your castle. And so this doctrine allows you to protect yourself at all costs. Now, if the man is just standing outside and shouting, you can't put your gun through the door and say, I'm going to take your life. No, you're a murderer. You do not repay evil for evil. That's all the scripture and that's all these laws are mimicking the Bible. That's what it's coming from. Do not repay evil for evil, brothers and sisters. If the offense is a simple insult, if it's a simple insult, guess what? Don't try to make it into what it is not. Don't let someone tell you that you are soft. And if it was me, I would have done this and I would have done that. They're the same one that's going to look back when you're in jail. They're the same one that's going to try and move into your territory when you're locked away for life in prison. Do not repay evil for evil. Repay no one evil for evil. If the offense is minor... It can be overlooked and let it go. Why? Because we need, what, we need to do what is right in the sight of man. Because we are children of God. We are ambassadors for God. Our conduct must not betray the morals of scripture. Our conduct must not betray the morals of scripture. What do you mean? Matthew chapter 5 verse 16 it says, Let your light so shine before men that may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Your conduct must be reflective because once you are a child of God, you are a new creation. It's a very hard concept. It's a very hard concept to grasp. And that's the reason we have to teach these things to the church. We have to teach these things. We have to embrace these things. I'm not saying that you should go out there and pretend like you're a pacifist. I'm not saying that someone is going to dip their hand in your pocket and you're going to say, go ahead, take it. You're going to look at them and say, you're really taking that? Go ahead, take it. Some people go overboard, you know. You sit down and someone walk in your yard, moving out all your stuff, and you're going to say, you can just go through the back door. You know what? That piece of furniture is too big. We took it through the garage. Bring it through the garage. Take it. No. That's frivolous things. Frivolous. Two wrongs don't make a right in terms of this scenario right here that we're talking about. Now, if someone is breaking in, someone is trying to kill you and you defend yourself. That's not two wrongs. You're defending yourself. But if you should roll over and let them kill you, then you're a fool. You are a fool. Your duty is to protect yourself and to protect your family. But simple little things right here. 
Romans chapter 12, 17. Let's put it in perspective. Repay no one evil for evil. Do not entertain. Do not entertain evil intent for something that is simple. Do not entertain evil intent for something that's past and gone. And that's something that many churches glorify. If it was me, huh? when I'm done with his family, when I'm done with him, no. Vengeance is mine. And that's the reason it's so tough, you know. Someone really wants to change. Even when they have done wrong, they have been to prison, they have gotten out. You're going to use wisdom as to per the Holy Spirit. And they decide to turn their life around and they're coming in the church. And everybody is against them. When the scripture says right here, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. But you say, let him die out there. You're rowing past him in a boat. Ah. Now it's your turn. Now it's your turn. And then as a child of God, you're going to shout, it's karma, honey, you know. No. You don't believe in karma as a child of God. We've been there already. There's no karma in the kingdom of heaven. There's no such thing as any karma. Karma is from another religion. Karma is telling you is that by your works you will inherit. Karma is telling you is telling you about about a, a, a flesh rebirth, and it's appointed unto man to die once. So don't believe in any reincarnation in any karma. You got to dig deep. Stop telling people karma is on you, and you pass them. I know it. You know. I know one day it was going to come back on him. No, vengeance is mine. As a child of God. As a child of God, you should do your best to represent and represent the body of Christ. The scripture says right here in verse 18, If it is possible as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. It says, Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give, give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. It's very hard. I'm telling you it's very hard. I'm not sitting up here pretending like I'm some squeaky clean person. I have to give it over to God. It's very hard. But once you practice this thing, once you practice as the scripture say, as you practice and live by his word, then it will become natural to you. Many of us have been insulted, I say. Insulted in front of our family members, in front of our kids, in front of our spouses, in front of our families. Insulted to the point that you feel like you would do someone something. Insulted that sometimes you cry. Insulted so till you are weak. You don't even want to leave your house. You don't even want to see the light of day. Insulted to the point that you are depressed. But that does not give you right to take matters in your own hand. This is not Hollywood movie. You don't sit in your house for years and you plan, this is what I'm going to do to them. When they least suspect it, this is what I'm coming to do. And when they least suspect it, that's when you come. Ah, you remember when you beat me up? Remember when you, I remember when I was going to school, I was a little kid once, and some guy beat me up. Well, they wouldn't say beat me up. It was a fight. It was a fear fight, but he was bigger than me. I didn't go home and tell them this. No, I don't go home and tell people that you get in a fight. It was a fear fight. He was bigger than me, but so he was able, he had the better, he had the upper hand. And man, I just used to walk around and I was just thinking that, man, one day I'm going to get this guy. And you know that me and the guy turned friends. <laughs> what am I going to do? I have no time to walk. You can't walk around. And some of us walk around with this vengeance within us. Can't wait for the, can't wait. We call it for the right time to strike. There's no right time for vengeance. 
There's no right time to repay, repay a grudge. There's no right time. A grudge is a, a, a feeling of persistent ill will. There's no right time. So read your mind, read your hearts of grudges, my brothers and sisters. It is very hard to do. You can't do it on your own. You can't do it on your own. You cannot do this on your own. And that's the reason the scripture tells us. Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome by evil. But overcome evil with good. Overcome evil with good. I tell you this is a very difficult concept. And many... Many wars have been fought today. It's because of generational things. Generational things. Sometimes we don't even try to remedy the situation. We want to continue to prolong and to stretch this thing out. You do not know that sometimes if you meet with the so-called enemy, the so-called enemy is the nicest person in the world. The so-called enemy has the answer to elevate you. I wonder how much sometimes some of us are so filled with hate. Even in the hospital, we are so filled with hate. We don't want someone to take care of us. I remember one time I was in the hospital taking care of, I've taken care of many people. Racist people. Man spewing hate left, right and center. Spewing hate and can't even help himself. And then I sat down and then I talked to this man and one particular man. They were talking and I'm calling certain names and it was like, that's a very good man. That's a good man. And then by the, by the end of the day, guess what? That man that was spewing all this racist thing. Me and him were palsy walsy. And guess what? I see people looking like me visiting him. Oh, he's a good man. I remember once taking care of some, some, some guy in pain and all sort of stuff. Felt so ashamed trying to hide. Big swastika on his back. Because he did not know. He, did, he, he, he grew up you know. He grew up being taught hate. And so he, 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 he feel as if that. Everyone that doesn't look like him was inferior. But when he came in guess what. He had all people with strange accents taking care of him. All people with, strange, with, with different skin tones taking care of him. And none of the people that he associated with were qualified to take care of him. And they're all sitting there like... By the end of the day, it was a different perception. Now, if I was about to repay evil for evil, I could say, I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make you feel some pain today. Um, I'm going to make you feel some pain today. Yes, I'm going to withhold it for him. Can you order some pain medication for him? No. No. Let him feel the pain. No. We do not repay evil for evil. Vengeance is mine, say the Lord. And there's many, many stories throughout history where men who were perpetrators of evil turn around and become champion for a cause. And I'm not saying it's going to be so at all times. That's the reason God says, vengeance is mine. Vengeance is mine. So the moral is, and I hope you appreciate this, very simple. Two wrongs do not make a right. I don't matter what they want to say to you. If someone is, if someone is actively trying to hurt you, running in, coming to take your life, to do what? You have a right to defend yourself. Even in society's law, there is such a thing as self-defense. The Bible talks about self-defense. And when we talk about self-defense, it does not mean you're going to plan. That's called premeditated. You don't plan to do this. You don't plan. Uh, you know what? He did this to me, so I'm going to go back and get him. That's premeditated. And no one will have mercy on you at that time. So brothers and sisters, it is clear today, we can't follow society. We cannot follow the world because we are not of the world. Though we live in the world, we have a renewed mindset. We should think different. We should act 
act different. We should behave different. We should try our best to reflect the moral of Scripture. That's the reason the Scripture says, if it is possible, as much as depend on you, live peaceably with all men. As much as depend on you, and that's the reason you're going to allow the Holy Spirit to minister unto you, the Holy Spirit to lead you, the Holy Spirit to, to, to minister, the Holy Spirit to tell you what to do. Because if it was up to me, if it was up to you, the entire world would be in chaos. And so brothers and sisters, today is the day. If you're holding on to a grudge, it's time for you to drop it. It's very hard, you know. Grudges age you. Grudges bring you stress. Grudges make you don't sleep. It's like someone renting a room in your head. You wake up in the middle of the night and you're thinking about, wonder what they're doing. They're sleeping nice and peaceful in their house. And you wake up, I wonder what they're doing. You are the one with the problem. You walk down the street, you have a panic attack. And that's the reason you must come to God. You must come to Christ because that's the only way you're going to get a peace that surpasses all understanding. So if you're walking out there, if you're out there and you do not know Christ as Lord and Savior, now is the time to come to him. You want some help to let go of, uh, uh, of certain, certain feelings, certain hurts. Come to him. And letting go of the hurt, don't get it misconstrued, does not mean you're, not go you're going to go back in the same situation. It does not mean you, if you're molested, you're, gonna let the, you're not going to go and beat up the molester and do something. You're going to let the law take care of it. Does that mean you're going to allow certain nastiness to go unnoticed? No. I show you the example where Paul used the system to get a judgment and you can too i'm just saying two wrongs don't make a right so brothers and sisters embrace this remember the scripture repay no one evil for evil have regard for good things in the sight of all men if it is possible as much as depends on you live peaceably with all men then it goes on to say, Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And so, brothers and sisters, that's what the Holy Spirit wants you to hear today. In Jesus' name, Amen.